Hey, this is Evan Phillips from Anchorage, Alaska. You're listening to The Fern Line. Alaska, the highest concentration of big, remote mountains in North America. For generations, a unique group of climbers have tested themselves in these vast alpine arenas. The Chugach, St. Elias, the Hayes, Neocola, the Kachatnas, the Revelations. Their stories are etched on high alpine walls. Their visions follow lines of cold gray ice. What inspires them? What makes them come back? Who survives? Who suffers? These are the stories we'll tell on season one of The Fern Line. On today's episode, we'll get to know Alaskan alpinist Charlie Cicera. Charlie's had a lengthy climbing career that spans 30 plus years and includes many bold and visionary ascents on Alaska's mountains. His lead role in the rescue of his partner, Jack Tackle, from the north face of Mount Augusta in 2001 is the stuff of legends and epitomizes the characteristics of the true alpinist. Commitment. Loyalty. Trust. But how did Charlie get to that point? What experiences shaped him and developed him into the climber and person he became? How far was he willing to push himself in the mountains and at what cost? These were some of the questions I had when we sat down to talk in October 2016. We started by discussing Charlie's inspirations as a kid and how he first got into climbing. My uncle and my grandfather, and part of the time my dad were linemen. They were going out on these jobs climbing poles, and so I imitated them. But um, we had a lodge with um, that had was made out of log, and so I would take a hammer and sixteen penny nails and nail my way up these logs cool. and string <laughs> wire in the house when I was this little tyke, you know, four <laughs> or five years old. So I spent all this time climbing imitating them climbing on the building and we had dog a dog team and stuff so it was always outside and going on stuff so it was it was um the actually it was probably driving back from in back into anchorage and seeing pioneer peak and saying you know you know i i, I want that you know, yeah. <laughs> I want that, you so, know. So there was, you definitely did have like a time, like as a team where you, where you kind of made that connection that, whoa, there's like big mountains around here. Yeah. Lots of adventure. Yeah, right. Yeah. But there wasn't anybody to participate with. So we just, we just went. We didn't, we didn't know anything. We just went. It was, but in the, what interrupted that was my dad ran for um, uh, lieutenant governor and didn't win. And he was kind of just got needed a change and he still had connections in the states and so i was on this also in this path i wanted to play football and thought i was going to be something special and so we moved to florida and i went and played football in in florida and had this other life which was around sailing and and you know uh, diving and uh and football and then at the end of high school went to Florida State, walked on at, at Florida State, but it didn't, it didn't work out. And, um, and then it was back in Alaska right after that time that I finally was able to do, you know, have the expression of, you know, climbing. But actually the first technical climb I ever did was in South Georgia in um, 
Yona Mountain. It's an, it's an old uh, ranger training facility. And it's, a, it's the southern tip of the Appalachians. It's a little uh, granite bath lift down there. Huh. So, uh, So was it after college? Yeah, it was actually in college that this friend, this I met this guy, and it's, and he says, yeah, I've done some climbing, and I wanted to do it, and you know, there was, but there was no expression of it, no way to do it, and so um, he had this Volkswagen bus from up here that I, I had bought. I had worked on the pipeline, and um, I basically six months straight on the pipeline that paid for college, but I had this Volkswagen bus with studs on the rear wheel and it's down there in Florida with these studs on the on the you know stud snow tires and we um went up in the winter up into Georgia to the Yona mountain and he says you know I've got a couple carabiners and we bought some rope and we repelled you know it was really uh, totally lame and <laughs> and um you know but we were that it was totally hooked in that experience yeah yeah it yeah. was fun cool um, so talk about the transition from first, like getting into doing, you know, doing yeah. your first kind of roped technical stuff and then to, you know, what was that progression like? Well, it was the only thing in the world that mattered. It was, I just wanted it so badly that, um, and there wasn't anybody to learn, so we just went and it was and most of the time, what the consequence was that around here is that we would climb you could, if you could climb it, you could lead it. <laughs> and, and so, okay. And I, and it was really, and I, and it was down there. There, there wasn't any hang dog in. Was, well, we didn't know anything, yeah, right? Yeah. And so, I've got I actually have a photograph of my very first technical lead, and I was, and I, I was in Southern California, and I, and I went to this shop and bought this kit a used kit you know it's just all these chocks and everything and i drug it around with me for at least a year and drug it all the way to europe and i'm in wales and my girlfriend and i were in wales in snowden and i decided i was going to go rock climbing in my first technical rock pitch and there's a photograph of me about 60 70 feet up this thing of no consequence with this giant rack and nothing in <laughs> <laughs> because nothing, nothing is in the rock. You know, it's, like, it's this yeah. perfect huge rack, yeah. but not a thing, single yeah. thing. Because I didn't. It's like I didn't need it. Well, what's yeah. the big deal? Yeah. Well, mostly because I didn't know anything. But the um, the transition, um, because there was no mentoring, there wasn't anybody to learn from. We just went from this perspective. We played outside as kids, um, and in Alaska. You know, with snow machines and camping, and just we just were outside all the time. So it was, it was really, it wasn't a big deal to be out or to be cold or to be playing in the snow and things like that. And so when the Department of Transportation, um, and it was like 79, 78 or 79, they blasted the road down to uh, on, on the highway and opened up that ice climb that's now called Roadside Attraction. Um, and we just waited and waited for it to freeze. We had no idea what was going to happen. We just waited. We, we saw the seeps coming down. Yeah, and we, th we yeah. would read enough. And so we bought some ice tools and we waited it no to shit. freeze. Wow. <laughs> and so we tried a couple times before it was thick enough to climb it. <laughs> And we finally, and it was it was Vern Tejas and Brian Kennard and I. We you know we had this amazing siege of this 110 feet of yeah. thing, right? Yeah. And uh, and and then I, we did that, and then I went away and helped my dad bring a sailboat from <laughs> Miami through the canal up to San Diego, and then I came back, and then um, I did this little scrappy little climb up on suicides and then we decided to go to deborah and try this new route okay, <laughs> so it was yeah. because it's like yeah that's oh yeah we could do that then we could do this so what so oh, it was 80 I that think. was 1980 yeah okay so two thoughts like <laughs> roadside attraction it's interesting because that's probably one of the first grade four ice climbs i, I ever did and, yeah. and i just remember it being a, a big deal it was a very big deal yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, and it's because it's it it's scary because there's not a some alluvial fan at the bottom that you're gonna fall. You can you know kind of catch yourself with. You're gonna hit the flat asphalt. Yeah, and and you can. There's also the 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 issue of knocking down ice onto vehicles. And, oh yeah, which has happened right. many times. It's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that was... That's funny. Okay, so you did roadside attraction. And then you did a scrappy route on one of the suicides. Yeah, and then um, was it like a like a technical climb? Yeah, yeah. But um, we didn't weren't able to finish it because it was just too hard. And uh, and then then uh, about a month later, we went to Deborah and climbed the west face to the northwest ridge and got way 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 up there and. And and right at the height of it, my dad and my mom and my brother flew by in a little uh, piper, and it was it was a trip. Were you able to go to the top? No, we I I took a big whipper off the um the ridge line, and like fell through a cornice. It just broke off, broke and uh, slid down, you know, and stopped below the um the face, and then. Uh, that pretty much scared us to death. <laughs> so we, did, yeah. so we wrapped the, the face. So you climbed the west face, basically. Yeah, yeah. Up to the up to the just below the summit, pretty much. Pretty much, but it. I mean, we missed it by an, enough that you say it wasn't even close. <laughs> After that, I was in um, finished my college in Western Washington, and there it was you know learning the rock climb in Washington, Squamish, and and. Uh, you know, they were, there was nothing of any particular note other than the fact that it was when I, I actually learned to rock climb. Okay. Um, and what were, where were some of the places you were climbing down in Washington? Uh, up at Squamish and, um, you know, did some, an aid climb up there, first aid climb, and the smoke bluffs. And um, I think the first thing we did was I soloed the um, north face of Shuxon and... Um, and the hardest part there was the woods and the, all the broke, the timber yeah. laying down, you know, and the walking in, that kind of <clears> stuff. And then, you know, climbed um, Mount Stewart in the winter and and um, we're in Leavenworth and and um, and Index and those kinds of places. And, um, you know, I, I really enjoyed it, but I really ultimately wasn't all that good at it, but had, you know, a lot of fun. Yeah, well, your legs were too big. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were, they were too big. <laughs> Arms are too small. Legs are too big. Um, um, so, did you have any like heroes? Like, well, back then there were some, and the one that my aunt gave me uh, uh, the book, um, the last step, or I think it was about K two, and so because they were, it was in that the Northwest people and such, and so it was. The, in the first, it was those group. You know, it was Ross Skelly and and uh, um, and Wickwire and and that and that group of people that were there. And my uncle um, was um, introduced me to Jim Wickwire, and so we had lunch. And it was in that time frame, and I was you know so eager to go. I, I want to yeah. go. I want to go. I want to go. And he, uh, you know, and he was being cool, and he'd been to K two, and you know, and he was just just so cool <laughs> and and i just was like you know found and i want to go and he, I, I how do i go i want to go can i go either can i go next get a go yeah. and he and he goes well you got to climb something kid you know and you know it's like kind of put me off and then and then the next year i did the west rib in the winter and i called jim and I said, what about that and he goes well, you did what but he had the thing was that jim i saw the kind of climbs he was doing and it was interesting is there was he you know, we were built about the same, and he he had uh, I could see the kind of roots they were doing, and I kind of liked them. But then, they were, but I also realized pretty soon that what his his choices were really dangerous, and so I like, and I kind of saw that later. A lot of objective hazard. Yeah, and it was not like eh, I got it, and I had to ha- I had to learn it myself. Yeah. But ultimately, they were not good roots to be doing.
Every alpinist has a turning point in his or her career. This usually comes down to learning how much you're really willing to commit. For Charlie, that point came in 1983, when he and a small group of friends set out to make the first winter ascent of Denali's West Rib. After two weeks of acclimatizing and slowly working up the mountain in 40 below temperatures, Charlie and his partner, Robert Frank, made the summit. But tragedy struck on the way down when Robert, most likely exhausted from the summit push, slipped and fell, tumbling thousands of feet down the mountain to his death. I asked Charlie to talk about the climb and how he dealt with losing a friend in the mountains. Well, we were working construction, and the, so there wasn't that much work in the winter, so it was, that's when we climbed. It wasn't a big leap, and actually the, what preceded it was a notion. So I, I had this th- thought, you know, I was going to, like when you're a kid, you know, you're going to be an Olympic champion. Well, I want to be this big climber guy. So my plan that year was two routes in the winter. One was a, a north face of Moffat. Um, and there was a big ice face on there, and and a new route on Denali in the winter, and and that was the that was the perspective, right? That was the objective, yeah. you know, thinking and talking big, and so uh, we were going to go to um, Denali first, and then to Moffat. And I wrote and got sp- some sponsorships. Got Marmot gave us some tents, the little Taku tents, and so. The but the actual leap to climbing in, in there in the winter was not it, it wasn't did we weren't fearful of it or that it was scary or, or that it was a big leap it was just an extension of running around in the winter in the Chugach and just um, playing right yeah. it was just how we lived and so and there we couldn't find um, we didn't know anything about the mountain. We, we couldn't find the park service, didn't know that they had closed down in the summer. And so we didn't ever register. We just went up there. Wow. And um, there was this route between the West Rib and the um, Buttress. It's, it, it's, it's sort of a, um, a diamond-shaped sh- um, uh, face that's really a, a S-shaped cool, uh, with an S-shaped couloir. It's about 5,000-foot couloir or something that that comes up and joins the West Rib at about 15,000. And so we wanted to do that and then join the Rib and go up. But when uh, we got there, we realized it was over our capacity to do it. And we switched to the Rib. But none of us had ever been to Denali before. We didn't know anything about the West Buttress or how to get down it. So we climbed the Rib as we progressed up the mountain. And after about, after the snow domes, we just put the rope away. And so we did, to get down, it was we had to down climb the route as opposed to going to the West Buttress because we didn't know any, we didn't have, have any idea what it was about. So, um, but we, you know, we had an immense amount of food and just we like for the on the first it took us two weeks before we started the route, and we were skiing around there, and the because um, we we're all framing outside and working outside we were pretty robust and you know it's it 40 below zero and I, and I wore on just those um, yellow monkey face um, cotton work gloves for two weeks wow. at 40 below <laughs> and it was it was because we were eating so much yeah. we were just like these little radiators yeah. and we had pans of lasagna yeah <laughs> you know we just dro- yeah. we just we had yeah. massive amount of food yeah. um, so who all was on that team? It was um, uh, Robert Frank. He was 38. I was 26. And then um, Steve Teller, who was about the same age as I, and Chris Rayback. And were these all dudes you were working with? Yeah, they were um, geologists. Okay. As I worked for um, Anaconda when we were they're doing the exploration work in Alaska. And that was one of the... That's how I got to know those guys. And Steve was... a uh, from Montana, and it was part of that group uh, that actually Tackle was associated with out of Bozeman and such in the, in the uh, late 70s. So he was a, a more accomplished ice climber than the rest of us, and uh, Chris was just, I don't remember what his 
background was, but he was just friend and enthusiastic. Yeah. And so, like, how how did the trip go? Like up to the point where was it you and Robert who went for the summit? Yeah. By so the other two didn't go. Well, everybody left sort of independently at night because it just got done eating and. And we were sort of actually on the edge of the south face because the route that we ended up climbing was sort of to the right of the rib. Um, and Chris had taken a fall um, at the top of the couloir because um, it was all blue ice. There was no snow you know, on this thing. And uh, he, he took a fall and twisted his ankle pretty badly. And so he was not really up for the big, you know, yeah. for the, that day. And he, so he chose to stay. And then so um, um, Steve and I and Robert took off. And we, we probably left within an hour or so of each other. And it, we were just soloing up there. And so we climbed it through the night, through the, you know, early light. And then about 18 or 19,000, um, Steve was having trouble with altitude. He decided to turn around. And then Robert and I continued up to the you know football field and across and over to the summit. So, so um, how'd you guys feel when you got to the top? Um, I would say. Uh, I mean, this is the first time that probably both of you had been to the top of Denali. We, none of us had ever been there. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, there, there, it, there wasn't really. It was sort of like uh, trepidation. Uh, you know, it was okay. Now let's pay attention. You know, and and so, so you you knew it was a serious situation. Oh, totally. You know, it was it wasn't it wasn't really scared, but it's like you know, it was yeah. there was there was a, even a discussion whether or not we should go to the summit yeah. because you're up to the top of the rib and you're, you're going yeah well there's a flat area that's yeah. good enough but we we walked over you know to that yeah. and uh, the. Um, and what the conditions were was ice and grapple and stuji that is on the wall. And we were following the resistant, climbing the resistant plates of stuji, mm -hmm. you know, and it would be, so you get to an edge of it and there all of a sudden it would be this, you know, unconsolidated grapple and, and just you know, sort of loose snow ice that doesn't, it's not really connected, right? Yeah. And then, and then an ice yeah. layer. So it's just really variable conditions. Yeah. So we're staying out on the hard snow as much as we could, and then, and we, you know, pretty early on, you know, on the route, realized it was easier to climb with one tool than two because it takes less energy. Yeah. And you know, they were just so. I think that he broke through that edge and slipped to another, to onto that uh, that dry snow. And then hit me in the chest, and that's when the accident. So, I mean, where did that accident happen? Do you remember? Um, like it's it's you know like I think it's like nineteen three or what? What was just it's just below a couple hundred feet below the uh, the edge. The summit ridge. Well, it's not really summit. It's it's the plateau edge. Yeah. Okay. You're coming back down, uh, and and so, and and then when he hit me, I went backwards over and. Um, under my back and then was able to self-arrest um and it was really really violent and yeah. very very fast and it was and it you know i was sort of in retrospect i was thankful for playing football because it was all about this super rea fast reaction yeah. and strength so um i mean i can imagine that that must have been like a pretty devastating experience i mean at, at the well, at the time like were you what were you going through when that happened it's a well um so there's the violence of the of stopping right and in in the stopping um you know it's it's surreal because like what well, crampons flying through the air and is it grabbed the crampon before it got away from me and you know so this there's this there's the okay controlling it but then once i was sort of squared away saw robert tumbling uh then you know it was returned to the work of you know sort of getting myself oriented to put the crampons back on on the slope and then you know 
continued down and it was um you know, I would see patches of blood, and then I finally found a piece of bone. Uh, and the oddest thing was he had a Nikon, and the body, the camera lens was broken off, and the body of the camera was sitting on a sun cup on a 45-degree slope. Why it stood stopped there is the weirdest thing, but it was out in this open face. And I, but the part, the most emotional experience was uh, finding. Um, a Dockstein glove, not the mitten, but the glove, because it was in the shape of this, my his hand, right? And it's just that short amount of time that person was there, and because that was the you know human expression of the, the glove, right? It's all there's a human, right? And that's not confused with anything else. So, and I just uh, you know I c- continued to climb down and finally got to our camp at seventeen two. And, uh, you know, and they said, you know, they looked at me and said, what happened? I said, well, I told them that Robert was gone. And then, then it was, they admitted they heard him slide by. Because the, it's, the tent was only within maybe tens of feet of the fall line. And, uh, and then it was, a, you know, a breakdown. Everyone broke down and cried. And, but there was really not a, there was... The weather was bad. You know, they would come in, and so we couldn't really move. So we spent a, se- a second day there, and then the the next day we continued down, the um, and tried to stay, tried to follow the fall line, and we finally someplace near the um, where the crevasses started to show up. We found a place where likely he had you know come to rest in one of the cre- big crevasses ab- above the south face, and then we climbed back to the rib. But we we didn't we, we never did see him. the The emotional part was that it was I would have dreams for a year. I had dreams where he'd come back and go, "Well, how come you didn't come get me?" Right. Mm-hmm. So the guilt dreams, and it was about it was almost a year later that it was in a dream that he said, you know, gave me permission to move on, which was, you know, you know, I'm dead come on it's okay you can accept it and you know and then that was the last that was the last dream I had where he you know I had that vision of his communication following his experience on the West Rib Charlie embarked on a path that would put alpinism as the driving force in his life. After nearly succeeding on the west pillar of Makalu in 1984, Charlie turned his attention back to Alaska. But after another brush with death on Mount Johnson in 1987, Charlie began to re-examine his motives and refine his style. Over time, Charlie learned that for him, alpinism was more than just a sport. It was a creative outlet, a means of self-expression. Moving over the purest, most beautiful line was the ultimate goal. This vision was realized in 1997, when Charlie and his longtime partner Carlos Bueller made the first ascent of the 8,000-foot east face of University Peak in the Wrangell St. Elias. As before, it was about the line, and we had I'd flown past it, and I had a video uh, that w- I shot with Paul in probably '89 or '90 or something, or someplace in there that went and s- saw this this particular line, and um, and I got back with Carlos doing routes, and we were trying some routes in the Tuarpies and uh, made the first ascent of Miller and, and these, a couple of these other big waterfalls in the, uh, in the Chitna Valley. And it was, it was probably first time that I saw it with Carlos was 95 
or or 96 or 95 i think and so it was 97 it was after one of these um you know sort of family adventures out there that the, the weather and the things came together to try it and paul landed us and we packed um four days of food and fuel and um you know we had been our our experience together we did we did we climbed really well together and it um when there's more than two then it got complicated because carlos was a complicated guy but it was it was a time when you know there was a, there were fair, there weren't that many americans that would climb with him because he was just he was just kind of a con, he was a complicated person you know and uh you know he was he was real successful with the russians and and the spanish and um european other european climbers but he wasn't that successful with americans and you know he he was different um and but somehow he and i um did well together and so we landed and then skied up and did a and we, what we used to do is try to get a measure or try to shorten the mountain by getting a measure of it by going up and booting up as high as we could with no gear and see what it felt like and so we so we went up about 1500 feet and made a stash and came back down and then the next day we got up and we you know we had very very little when the the style of climbing that we did at that time was we were we weren't that fast but we didn't carry any weight and we we just never really we were never, didn't really stop um per se and we we pitched more than they do now um which means you know we were blaying the pitches and i think on that route there was like 50 or 55 pitches or something like that and so um but it was more it was more deliberate less gear more deliberate so we took six eye screws you know like six pins and six chocks and uh four days of food and fuel and you know no helmets and so it was relatively light um the gear and such but tenuous very very steep climbing um and you know uh a lot of you know like class three and class four water ice you know for thousands of feet that yeah, kind of thing basically like am- an amazing <laughs> yeah like I'm the, like amazing yeah. yeah and we and what was so stunning was so the first day we so we made the cash came back down came, went back up and it snowed and then we were like well it's over you know this is too this is dumb it's it's going to be over so let's so we sat there and ate for a day and then that night it stopped snowing and the next morning it was crystal clear and not a breath of wind and so I'm like well what do you think shall we leave shall we go you know and we took off and it was stunningly beautiful and quiet and not a breath of wind for 3 days as we climbed this thing this tip 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 you know and we were on this arete um about the third or fourth day that had w- was covered with these feathers of beautiful powder of feathers and then they were you know they as they start to dry out and it's this big you know um um this beautiful snow that was just as light as it could ever be but it's just suspended and there's no nothing so you're just climbing but no stress on weather or anything like that and then um just and what the crux of the we didn't really know about there was several of them but the last particular crux was going through the ice cliff at the top and it had you know a couple pitches of boilerplate ice and you know like grade 4 with a pack and you know storm so we got it, it gave us a little sting at the top yeah but what one of the things that gave us a lot of confidence is we heard Paul flying over the tops so we knew it wasn't it was just a localized storm versus something yeah. bigger. Yeah. Which yeah. is which is uh that's a good thing to realize when you're in that situation <laughs> like oh okay well. Yeah. And so, you so know. It, it, on that climb, <clears throat> I mean, I actually remember, you know, this was that was like really kind of when I really was get kind of yeah. getting into climbing. I was probably like 21, 22 mm-hmm. when you did that and I remember chatting with you at, mm-hmm. at some point in time afterwards and you just talking about a couple pitches on that route. Mm-hmm. It was just 
perfect. They were. Perfect alpine climbing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, I remember you describing being in a, in a book. Yeah. There was this one. We, we, <laughs> it was funny because we came, out, we came off the left-hand side of this arete and back to the arete and made these really complicated moves through these towers. And uh, it was funny because Carlos, was, he would go, why was that so easy for you, you know? <laughs> and he goes, you know, I've been climbing with Carl and on, down there at, on Ptarmigan or whatever it was, you know, something smart-ass like that. But it was fun. And, and then the, this, this transition from these towers was, like you said, it was just an, a, an open book to wide enough for your, the stem that's on the top of a, a ret. So an, an open book on the top of a ret. Yeah. And you just stem, uh, you know, <laughs> with thousands of feet on either side yeah. and, you know, and have that, have that, you know, like <laughs> get my picture right now because yeah. this is really sexy stuff. Basically, you know? <laughs> the ki- there are the kinds of like uh, positions and like pictures yeah. that you, you, you dream about them. Right. And exactly. then you're there and you're like, oh my God, this is. This is really happening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How lucky. <laughs> it was, you know, it was a culmination of the relationship and, and, the, and the partnership I had with Carlos and the things I had learned from him over the years about the, the discipline of the work and the approach to it and the real subtle, small things. And, and then, you know, the line you know, how pretty that line was. But, um, you know, the other interesting thing that I learned technically on that climb on the way down was d- down climbing the North Ridge, um, uh, you, I, look, I look backwards to navigate. So I would look back up the mountain to see where I would put myself for that position and then project it below me because you can't see down those snowy Mm -hmm. edges and so you could see you could look you could make a navigating decision looking upwards but you couldn't look it down and so i i i i I put the route back together looking backwards to get uh, get, to get off of it and then and we and we used used it you know like just use stuff sacks to repel off of In my conversation with Charlie, a recurring theme was the loyalty he felt towards his partners. Nowhere was this more evident than on a 2001 attempt on the north face of Mount Augusta with Jack Tackle. Near the end of their first day of climbing, Tackle was struck by a large rock, rendering him paralyzed on the side of the peak 50 miles from the nearest road. In what's become a legendary rescue in mountaineering circles, Charlie was able to secure Jack on the mountain, repel the face, and cross the glacier alone to the team's tent where a satellite phone was cached. 30 hours later, and against all odds, Tackle was plucked safely off the peak by the 210th Mountain Rescue and airlifted to a hospital in Anchorage where he started his recovery. I asked Charlie to talk about his relationship with Jack and the emotions he felt during and after the experience on Augusta. Well, it was the house that we had in, on H Street was a conduit for people to go to the range. And so people came through and I got to meet a lot of people, um, a lot of Europeans and, you know, and D- Dackel was part of that universe. And so... You know he's a he's a really dear person. Everybody loves him, and you know me included. And so you just you want to be with him, yeah. right? And um, so he had this. We were friends, and he went and had the the episode of Guillaume Beret, and uh, we you know almost died from that. And you know I stayed in contact with him, and you know and gave you know basically yeah well when you get better we'll do something. And so that was the hope of getting better and Augusta was that um the coming out from Garon Beret so and I found a, uh, Augusta from a photograph from somebody locally I, I may have been even Dave Hart that 
was asking me about King Peak, and and I was giving him information on King, and then I saw in the background Augusta. I didn't say anything to him. I said, and I, and I closed that conversation with him, that's, and then went over and go, "What's that thing? That, I like that." That's classic. <laughs> and so just, and then I then I paid Claus to fly me over, and I shot, I photographed it in the winter, and um, and then convinced Jack to go with me. We we got to be we we had been really good friends and but there was also this um, code that is unspoken about um, your commitment to the other person to do whatever it takes right and you you it's one of those things that is um, that's there that you're hoping that the other person has but you never want to actually express or have to deal with yeah. and so we um but it was uh you know it was a big part of how jack and i are are wired or who we are we didn't really know it until the ex the experience proves it right yeah. but we you sort of had this vision of yourself that you're gonna be brave and loyal and you know like the boy scout sort of vision of the thing and the interesting thing for me was that in in preparation for this one, I changed my training, and I was powerlifting, and I was the strongest I'd ever been as an adult. You know, I was I was real, and you know, I was only like forty two or something, and you know, so he had got is the combination. It's the intersection of being physically capable of doing something and the experience. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now they're all come together. What are you going to do? Right. So, um, uh, and when we started the climb, um, I could see that I was, um, physically stronger than him, uh, in, in, in both endurance, you know, and this physical, you know, capacity, but he was still, it was still capable, still doing it, still technically very, very adept, you know, but I was watching to see what was going on with him, and um, you know the climbing. You know it was it was hard enough, but it wasn't like super hard. And uh, you know, for the most part, we climbed with the packs on. There was a couple pitches we didn't have packs, but you know, we were we were climbing at a fairly high standard. But what happened was the temperature jumped and what started from like i don't know it was 10 or 15 degrees at the bottom and but when the accident happened it was probably 45 Ugh. and it was an inversion that came in from the uh canada and, the, and you could smell the the forest fires wow. from canada come across and hit the wall and then the wall fall apart when the accident occurred was he was looking for a place we were going to stop and rehydrate and maybe take a nap or something we were about halfway through what we thought was going to be the technical um climbing of the route before we got to this arete that would take us up to the you know basically a snow ice arete to the summit okay so. and then he gets hit with like a was it a rock or a block of snow no it's a rock it was about the size of a briefcase yeah and it hit him on like the back of the neck yeah the head and back of the neck so it broke his neck yeah. and busted his teeth out because I think he probably hit the rock on his face, so he lost some teeth, and uh, he was bleeding in the head, and and he was paralyzed. And uh, how long did it take you to figure out, like how serious it was? Oh, it's immediately evident that this is really deadly serious because yeah. it's not you know the person's unconscious and he had. Um, and he was paralyzed, yeah. so he couldn't move. And then, you know, and I was had this shot, a pretty big shot of adrenaline running through me. So I, I, what was wild is I just, I just grabbed him by the chest and moved around with one arm. He weighed 180 pounds and just, yeah. you know, move yeah. him like a drag doll. But, um, you know, it was the concentrate. You know, one was, you know, get him, get him locked in, get him stable, and then it took. It was probably eight hours of work to go through that plus the conversation it was actually jack's permission to let me go because yeah. i was planning to lower him 
So when he gave you permission to go try and get help, how did you feel? Guilty. Because it was likely that he wasn't going to make it. Yeah. I mean, were you, were you in your mind, did you guys talk about that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we did. And because, you know, it was, he, he said he couldn't do it. But, you know, it was too painful to move yeah. him and that kind of stuff. And I agreed with him because I could, you know, um, he was giving me an opportunity to live through this right yeah. by saying that yeah. because you know the you it, to lower and to do this whole thing you know 1500 feet off this glacier whatever it was you, you would meant you know rappelling down fixing an anchor jugging back up lowering jack you know so you have to do every pitch twice where the rocks are falling so you know and you're committed to one line you can't move laterally very much because of the weight right you how, how am i going to move them laterally yeah so you're committed to the line it's rocks are falling anchors are bad it'd probably kill us when you got ready to go when you guys decided that you were going to go for help mm -hmm. what was that conversation like oh it's heartbreaking um you know i i'm i'm sitting there with in my, I don't know why I had this in my head, but there's the speech that Caesar gives when they're going into battle, and he says, if we meet again, you know, we'll celebrate the day. If not, it was a party well spent, that one. And so, you know, it was really intense, you know. And, we, and what we said to each other was probably super simple, literally, because you can't actually speak these things in the moment yeah. you know um travel safe or something like that you know <laughs> yeah. fuck you <laughs> Why yeah. You? Like, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah so you know you know <laughs> but it's 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 a it's a monumental experience to let him go right yeah. and then and like all these other things the what the climbing is is you know how do you compartmentalize and move the work to something you can manage, right? Okay, I'm just dealing with this anchor. Nothing else, just this one. When this is good, then I can move to the next thing. And I can, you know, and so there were in the in the getting down, there was, you know, making Jack stable. Then there was getting off the rappel, getting to the skis, getting to the phone. So those were the pieces, right, of, of it. But you couldn't, you know, you may not see the next one yeah ever yeah so when jack got safely off the mountain mm -hmm. uh were, were you there were you in the helicopter or no no i was i was on the glacier in the fog when did you see jack again about a week later and where was that in in i think in my house because he had he gotten out of the hospital by the time i got out of canada yeah so it, he, he was staying at the house what was your guys's meeting like after that ex um, Well, I don't remember the meeting so much, but I know that there was a, the, the attachment was so intense that I, I had a hard time letting go of him, you know, even a week or two later. That's, that's the thing that was, it was an interesting, intense attachment. So what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you, you know, that kind of thing of just, staying in contact with the person right so it, it took a long time to for either of us to let go of each other and the experience In talking to Charlie about Jack and the experience on Augusta, I was reminded that some of the strongest relationships I've ever had were forged in the mountains. To know your partner has your back no matter what, that's a powerful thing. Since Augusta, Charlie's continued to climb in Alaska and abroad. 
He was co-founder of the Alaska Rock Gym and served as president to the American Alpine Club in 2012 and 13. Charlie says he's quote-unquote retired from alpine climbing, but I'm not sure I believe him, considering he was in the Alaska range last summer. Hoping to get a few more nuggets of wisdom, I asked Charlie what his upcoming plans were and what he sees in the future of Alaskan alpine climbing. I'd like to, um, I'd like to go to back to Europe and do long limestone routes in the either Picos de Europa or the Dolomites or, you know, I, I love the movement and feeling, you know, that and, uh, you know, I was a passable rock climber, you know, not a, a never been a great rock climber, but I love the movement and I want to climb those roots like that you know um those big long things and yeah. def- because it's they're so fun have you se- have you seen like alpine climbing in particular in alaska evolve oh and change over yeah. the last 30 years well if it to, in alaska to understand alpine climbing you have to understand aviation and the progress that has happened because it's only through it's a sort of a this this relationship between the aviators and the climbers that has built climbing because if they've got better like claws and and roderick and and geating and all and sheldon and all those people were allowed the access that wasn't that wasn't capable of getting because you you can't climb these really big technical routes um they wouldn't be developed without the aviator being there and so you know the old school old old school before we arrived was you know they were somehow skiing in or going over overland and that um and you're so they're more you you end up being more aggressive so there's technological the big ones is it's the there's training and the attitude you know there's sort of the progressions and the attitude what's possible and um so the tools changed and they became better um, and but right now, I think the biggest thing that's changed it is the weather routing, and being able to understand the weather. Because if the weather is good, alpine climbing is easy, right? It's because you just limit it. Easier. <laughs> it's easy. It's easier because it's not that technical. Mostly, it's not that technical. But people are pushing the technical envelope because they've got they got more confidence in the weather. And uh, so with a weather routing, you know, you're losing, taking, you can push the window of what's possible. Um, you know, it, it just, that, that changes, the, completely changes the game. You know, like what Clint's doing, what did in out in the uh, Revelations and, and then John Kelly, and, uh, you know, and some of the routes he's done up in here, uh, in the Chugach over the years, and then down in, in off Juno in the ice fields, and so there are people, but there are less. There there have always been a, only a handful of people that would um, leave the, what is known, and that's what I liked about watching what you guys did. You know, when you had your run um, up here, because you were that's the kind of things that were you were going trying to do wilderness adventure. Yeah, climbing, yeah, you know exactly. Well, that maybe leads me into my next question is like, what's the future of Alaskan alpine climbing? Um, it's always been about the imagination. And so it's not being in it. You, you can't say what it is. It's someone coming up with a new approach to it. Right. And a little thing like little things like years ago, when Paul Claus was supporting these guys that were trying to parapen off of St. Elias, um, this guy left his partners from the top camp got up there and they happened to go out to take a leak or something and look up and the guy in you know hits the canopy and he takes off from saint elias but he hadn't told him he was leaving right he didn't tell him where he was going and he flew to icy bay and it it fucking took him days to find the guy paul flying around where you been you mind won't tell anybody so stuff like that 
for somebody there is the inspiration or just the fucking balls to just let go right well so and then years ago i bet these guys these hawaiians that were working there the electrician was working on my house and i was trying to understand you know he said oh you ski a little bit yeah i think climb a little bit oh you do this you know getting related and this guy is a snowboarder but he's not a snow. He's not a Alaskan. He's a Hawaiian. He's a surfer, and he came to Alaska for work. Saw the snowboarding thing. Started doing that, and he, and he realized and very quickly they hated walking up hills. So they they learned how to parachute, and they were up in hatchers in the late '80s, jumping out of airplanes with um, snowboards on. And, and taking these runs, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And they were jump. He said, when was the first time you tried it? And he goes, as soon as they got there, the first time they jumped out of an airplane with permission, with a, hel- with a parachute, was the first time they had it on their feet. Wow. Right? <laughs> so you don't even know what's going on, yeah. right? <laughs> it's, something, it's something like oh, that. That's funny. Um. What what advice could you give, like you know, an aspiring Alaskan alpine climber? Like, what 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 advice could you give? Well, you know, you gotta you gotta be strong physically. You gotta you gotta do the work. You can't just be, you know, there your your natural athleticism takes you so long. So there's a you know, it's doing the work. Um, I, I would say take big leaps. Because in the leaps is where the big learning is, but it's the risk is high, and so, um, you know, I I want to see them come back and say, hey, you know, Evan, you know that route that you worked on for you know, ten years, I just soloed it, <laughs> you know, yeah. I want I want I want them to just chew it up, yeah. <laughs> you know, that makes sense. <laughs> there's there's also an understanding that sometimes it's just about the work. Right. Yeah. You know, and like the the thing that I've told recently is I after Garvey and Alex Logue died, I wrote to myself, said, what does it take to stay alive? And I came up with five reasons or five little things. There's athleticism, fitness, judgment, executed in the moment, um, desire and luck. The answer to athleticism is you pick your parents. You, you either got it or you don't. You got to be an athlete, right, to do these things. The second one is you go to work to make yourself hard to kill. You know, you know the, it's in you, within your, you got to go to work. You got to be fit. You got to, you know, be strong. Judgment executed in the moment is hard to, it's sort of an experience of, it's a combination of experience and intuition, which is step left right now, yeah. right? No, put the blade right here. But, you know, sort of, a, which is, is this sort of holistic view of where you're going of this whole peak, right? A lot of people only think about the route, not the descent and, the, you know, the weather systems and all the whole piece, right? Then, then there's the desire, which is super important, which is, you know, you just want to live so bad, right? You're going ma- to bleed for it because people give up. If watch people give up, and then to all of those things go to minimizing luck, right? Because there is luck, but you don't want it to be dominant. Yeah. <laughs> so that was how it looked at it. But do you think you've been lucky? Oh fuck yeah! I'm one of the luckiest guys you have <laughs> ever met. I am totally lucky. Yeah. <laughs>